is Mitch Friedman. I own a little company called Union Scientific Corporation, but mostly I do engineering work and consulting for scientists who really want to speed up their protocols. Uh, a lot of guys uh, have been dealing with wet chemistry different ways, and a number of years ago, I was passing through a uh, pharmaceutical plant, and I noticed uh, the way they were mixing uh, chemicals and vats. Everybody is familiar with uh, vortex mixing. Sometimes the vessel is put on a platform, it's moved in an orbit. Sometimes they put a magnetic uh, stirrer right inside the thing, and uh, that creates an orbit, and that mixes. But it really doesn't mix. I mean, it mixes eventually, but if you've got a thousand samples to do a day, and each one of these things takes three or four minutes, that's a lot of minutes. And, and that's a lot, of, a lot of time wasted. So the first thing I realized is uh, that's really not a great way to mix. You take a look over here. This is an old, from an old movie film. Uh, there's the same whirlpool that these guys have spent all this money creating, and there's a ship. Now suppose that ship was a lump of sugar and the water was uh, coffee in a coffee cup. They're going to go around and around and around until they ultimately sink or disintegrate, and the lump of sugar will ultimately dissolve. But if you want to mix stuff rapidly, uh, that is definitely not the way to do it. Now, to complicate matters still further, many years ago, somebody said, look, we can't use beakers and stuff for mixing, for testing large volumes of samples. So they designed a platform called a microplate. Many of you watching this knows what a microplate is. And some of the first microplates had one, two, three, four, five, six times four, 24. There were some with only 12 as a means of saving all the glassware that they'd have to throw out and all the plastic bottles that they'd have to wait. So here I have a 24 uh, cell microplate, and these guys take it, and they put it on an orbital shaker, and the orbital shaker has an orbit of an inch. Now you can put something on an orbit of an inch that has a hole in it that's smaller than an inch. Nobody seemed to realize that. The orbit that you're shaking has to be smaller than the diameter of the vessel. To make it even worse, then they come along and say, no, we need even more holes. So then they come out with 96 holes. Now that means that orbit has to be, that diameter has to be less than a quarter of an inch. Otherwise, it's just gonna be like the planets going around the sun. Let's go even further. Here you have now 384. That means that orbit has to be smaller than 380, or 384 well plate. And uh, uh, the piece de la resistance is 1,536 cells. 1,536, can you imagine? You're gonna put that on that shaker? You can sit there till the cows come home. You leave it there over the weekend, nothing's gonna happen. So anyway, I decided to design stuff to help people mix quicker. I'm gonna shut this thing off here and I started to write several papers about mixing, and you can download these papers from my website. It has all the formulas necessary for what the diameter of the mixing radius has to be and so on and so forth. This machine uh, uh, I call a Vibro Tornado, and what it is is a platform mounted on springs. These white things are really reinforced fiberglass leaf springs, and they're supporting a platform that can shake back and forth in this direction. There's an electromagnet that shakes back and forth 60 times a second. Now, on that platform is a second set of leaf springs with a second platform, and that shakes in and out 60 times per second. Now, if I would put some microplates on there, and fill them with liquid and turn the power on and they both shook at the same time, what they're gonna do is just move diagonally. But this machine is designed so that when it shakes in this direction, by the time it gets to the end of its stroke, 
the other axis is energized and it shakes that way. When that reaches that end of the stroke, it comes back this way and it goes in a kind of a square. Uh, any of you remember they used to make toys for kids called an Etch-a-Sketch where you, you move stuff around. That's exactly how this works. This axis is moving, this axis is moving, but they're moving hundred and uh, uh, they're moving 90, deg 90 degrees out of phase with each other. So I'm going to turn the power on. Now I'm turning up the power. Now I'm turning up the power a little bit. Well, you see those? Uh, these are 384 well placed. I'm going to shut it off while you're filming. Now I'm going to turn it on again. There. See how quickly you have a vortex, and that's if a vortex is going to mix it, then it's mixed. And that's that's what's it. so to invest in a machine like this. If you're doing millions of samples a year, it's, it's going to pay itself for almost instantaneously. The other type of, of shaking that we've developed primarily for people who grow cells is horizontal shaking. And we picked a frequency which is ideal for cell growth. And here again we have the exact same electromagnet on this frame, it's a cast iron frame. And a platform is suspended with fiberglass reinforced leaf springs which are virtually indestructible. And let me uh, turn this machine on. Now these, here you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have 18 deep well plates. You can put a lot of cellular material in here. And now they're, they're shaking. Uh, there is a little uh, amplitude decal on here, which you probably can't see on, from where you are now, but you'll be able to see it on another machine, which tells you exactly how much amplitude you have so if you go back to do the experiment again uh, a day later or a week later, rather than looking at a number on a dial, you actually have the true displacement. And since the frequency is fixed at 60 cycles, you know exactly what the g-force is on your samples, and it's very, very repetitive. So this is a line of horizontal shakers. We make them this big, we make them a lot smaller. Also, when you're growing cells, uh, some cells grow in oxygen or in room atmosphere. Other cells are grown in incubators or in CO2. But basically, when you're growing cells, uh, and particularly in deep wells, you have a certain height of material, and you got your cellular material and the nutrients in each well. And then you have headspace, which has the atmosphere in it. Now, if you have a long growing cycle, maybe two days a week, you could use up all of the atmosphere inside the well, particularly uh, if the, these plates are tightly packed. Now, most people put a porous membrane to keep the stuff from flying out, but the atmosphere could still come out and atmosphere could still come in. But nevertheless, if these are put on the shaker and tightly stacked, you tend not to get enough atmosphere in your cell solution. So we, it's a simple thing, and I don't know why anyone ever thought of it before, but we make these spacers uh, and we encourage people to use them. You put it here and then between every cell, uh, you, have, uh, you have a space. So now uh, you could get atmosphere into each of these wells and the stuff grows much faster because you don't run out of, you need, you need liquid, you need food, but you need the gas that is, that these, uh, cells uh, required. In addition, we have found that a lot of guys who, who have to put even these seals on here, uh, they either have their lab uh, technicians put this, it's just nothing more than a piece of scotch tape, uh, and they put it on here and they're rolling it down with a brayer 
like a printer would use, or they go out and buy some sophisticated machine for $5,000, which slaps the thing on here. Once I understand what's going on in the lab, since I don't know, once I understand, I can often figure out a way to speed the guy's work up. Here, let's say you've applied the seal to this thing. We make this little thing with a rubber roller, turn the crank once, it comes out the other side, and it's sealed. Okay, this thing costs several hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars, and some labs use them and they like them. Uh, another, another microplate uh, we came across and some of our scientists were having a problem with it, and these are called strip wells. They're made by Corning. It's a very clever device. What it permits you to do is not waste the entire microplate, particularly for uh, you know, a very expensive procedure. And uh, there's strips of these things uh, that, uh, that come out. Let me take this out for you. There you go. And uh, they just can use one row at a time because these things tend to get pretty expensive. The problem is uh, when they come out and they want to get put back in to be put into a scanner, because this is the same format as a regular microplate and a lot of machinery in the lab is designed to hold it, so they put it into this format. The problem is uh, when they want to put, put the stuff back in to these things, we just tell them use our, uh, our regular uh, plate sealer and just run it through, it pushes them all in, and then they can send it through their scanner. Problem arises when they want to take out strip number one, strip number two, or strip number five, or whatever. Here's one all in white. Uh, uh, so we made this little machine for people who want it. Not very expensive. We put the tray in here. And let's say I only want, I want this particular strip out. So you just take it, pop it out. And there you have it. You do your testing, put it back in, take it out here, put it into here again, and you're ready to run it into, uh, into the big machine. So these are little gadgets that, that we make, which I find a very time-saving, because in the labs today, time is money, grant money is very important. You can use up all your grant money using a protocol which takes, you know, 15 minutes where it should be done in about 15 seconds. Here is a stack of uh, microplates and some tubes. These are 384 microplates. These are uh, 96, and this is a stack of 96 well tubes. Now, just like our other machines, it's magnetically driven, except the springs are horizontal, and this machine will move up and down. So I'm gonna turn this machine up now. And if you look at this decal here, that decal is actually showing you the amplitude. Where those two lines ultimately cross is going to show you how much it's moving. And it's important to know that. Now, you can see in, how, in what a very short time your samples get mixed. Uh, but the more important thing I'd like you to see is where these... We've written a paper on that, and you can download it off of our website. But I'm going to shut this off. Now I'm going to slowly turn it up. Look at this V tip. It will slowly move into the corner and it will slowly move up. Now where those two pieces cross on the screen, this here says this is shaking at 0.11, almost an eighth of an inch. In the paper you can download, uh, it'll show you how you use that decal. It's a poor man's accelerometer. And if you know how much it's moving, and we know it's moving at 60 cycles per second, you go to this chart and you, you go from 60 cycles and the, and the distance is moving, it will tell you what the acceleration force is. So tomorrow, if you put a different set of samples on there, but you want to have the same acceleration force, forget about the knob, just watch the decal. And if you set the decal to the same place where the, the lines cross, you will get exactly the same uh, mixing. This is very, very fast, and this particular uh, machine uh, is the one that's used in DNA analysis as a cleanup procedure, which used to take 
several hours, and now it can be done in, in a few minutes. A few years ago, uh, uh, the local television station was in here when uh, uh, the National Institutes of Health sent a couple of these machines to Monrovia, Liberia to uh, analyze the DNA in the Ebola virus. And uh, I guess the local uh, uh, television station got wind of it and they came down here. It does save an awful lot of time and I hope it did save a lot of lives.